We are the children of the stone. She supports us, shelters us, offers us the most priceless gifts of the earth. The worthy return to her embrace in death, becoming ancestors. The unworthy are cast out, unable to rest, that their failings may not weaken the stone. So it has been since the earliest memories. We live by the stone, guided by the ancestors, who speak with the voice of the provings, and whose memories the Shaperet keeps forever in lyrium. We do not accept the empty promises of heaven as the wild elves do, or vie for the favor of absent gods. Instead, we follow in the footsteps of our paragons, the greatest of our ancestors, warriors, craftsmen, leaders, the greatest examples of lives spent in service to our fellow dwarves. Our paragons joined with the stone in life, and now stand watch at our gate, ushering in those surfacers privileged to visit our city. We know there is no greater honor to hope for, no better reward for an exceptional life. Hello once again, my dear students. I am Professor Absalom, and in today's lesson about the history and lore of Thetis, we will continue to look at the major races of Thetis, with today's lecture being about the Dvarva, or the Dwarves, as they are more commonly known. As with the last lecture, we will have a basic overlook and summary of the Dwarves and their history and culture, with more detailed lectures about specific topics in the future. Now, let's dive deep underground and discover the history about the Children of the Stone. As with much of ancient Theodosian history, a lot has been lost to uncertainty, myth, and legend. What few things we do know have to be pieced together to create some sort of coherent chronological order. So it was for ancient Elvish history, and it is very much the same when it comes to ancient Dwarven history. Excluding some newer findings of recent years and exclusive sources, a lot of the information we have about Dwarven history comes from the illustrious institution of the Shaperet. The positives and negatives of this institution I have already elaborated on in a previous lecture, and will undoubtedly be elaborated on further in this lecture. With that out of the way, let's start with the connection between the Dwarves and the Titans. In the ancient past of Thetas, the Titans and the Dwarves were connected in some way, but how and to what extent we do not know for sure. A collection of sources, ancient texts, both Dwarven and Elven, claim that the Titans were the pillars of the Earth itself, that they had children and workers underground. Unique sources like the ancient elf Solas and a knowledgeable Dwarven scholar named Valta both claim that the dwarves used to be part of something greater in their earlier history, that the dwarves were linked to the titans, and when they fell, as Valta claims, the dwarven race fell with it. This information unfortunately only gives us more questions than answers. Are the dwarves the children of the titans? Did the titans create the dwarves for some specific purpose, and endowed them with unique abilities. What exactly caused the Titans to fall? Was it the war against the Elves? And what precise ramifications did this have for the Dwarves? We have no clear answers to these questions at this time, and much of it is pure speculation. Suffice it to say, the Titans may or may not have had a specific role in the ancient history of the Dwarves, but the true extent of that role is not known at the moment, and has to be the subject for future study. Moving on to slightly more certain territory in regards to Dwarven history, the start of Dwarven civilization began underground, below the surface of Thedas, where the Dwarves, thousands of years ago, 
started to build their settlements and tunnels. The Shaperet, responsible for the documentation of Dwarven history and lore, even claims that Dwarven history stretches back tens of thousands of years into the past, though this might also just be an exaggeration rather than a fact. The settlements and cities that were constructed underground by the dwarves, hewn from the very earth itself, came to be known as Tigs, and the enormous underground tunnels connecting these Tigs became known as the Deep Roads, which enabled travel between the settlements. The dwarvish Tigs were usually built under or in connection to various major mountain ranges, a feature which continued throughout the millennia until all of the major mountain ranges of Theta's surface had at least one or more dwarven settlement built underneath them. It would be of use at this point to elaborate a little bit on the physical appearance and attributes of the dwarves, since they vary both in body and in skills to other sentient creatures. Dwarves are physically quite short but broad of shoulder, with an excellent constitution and an almost unnatural ability to see clearly in the dark, which is quite a large boon if you live underground. Another unique feature of the dwarven race is their strong resistance against magic and their affinity with the material known as lyrium. Lyrium, as was briefly mentioned in the last lecture about the elves and will be elaborated on further in this one, were the blood of the titans and a mineral source of magic underground. Living and interacting with lyrium for thousands of years, even being able to sense it from afar, have made the dwarves virtually immune to magic, although this immunity can lose its potency over time if a dwarf spends too much time on the surface. The same can be said for the dwarves' innate stone sense, which helps them navigate the underground with ease. Dwarves are, however, unable to use magic, and throughout their long history there have been no exceptions to this rule as far as we know. These unique physical and mental features must have been quite striking and strange to the Elf Hen, when the Elves and the Dwarves first made contact with each other in minus 4600 Ancient. The circumstances surrounding this first contact is, like many other things, uncertain and lost to history. Whether this was before or after the Veil had been created, if the war against the Titans happened before first contact or even as a result of it, remains uncertain. For the most part, it seems that the two races were content to leave each other to their own devices, underground and on the surface respectively. Dwarven accounts from this time, just like elven counterparts, describes Thedas at this point in time as devoid of any other major sentient races excluding the elves, since the humans had not yet arrived on the continent. With time, the Tigs of the Dwarves grew in size, population and splendor. Distinctions were soon made between normal smaller Tigs and so-called Greater Tigs. These Greater Tigs later became the center of Dwarven kingdoms. Thus, the civilization of the Dwarves started to expand and grow exponentially, the Deep Roads starting to stretch far and wide as the early settlements underground culturally now started to take on the shape of kingdoms and soon enough an underground empire. As the centuries went on, the dwarven civilization spread far and wide underground, until the Tigs and the Deep Roads stretched from one end of the continent to the other. Great Tigs like Hormak and Gundar grew mighty and powerful in their own right, but soon enough all of the Dwarven Kingdoms and Great Tigs, of which there were twelve, and the innumerable other smaller Tigs all over the continent, united into the underground Dwarven Empire, ruled from the capital Tig of Kal Shirok. All the other Dwarven Tigs still retained autonomy, with their own governing bodies known as assemblies, but they were all sworn in fealty to the capital 
and its king. Some rare taigs were even built on or at least near the surface at this time, like the sea outpost and salt mine of Gwaren in modern day Ferelden, or Kalrapartha in today's western Orle. Trade, commerce, and the technological innovations of dwarven craftsmanship flourished during this period, as sections of dwarven society specialized in aspects like mining, stonework, smithing, trade, and the arts of war. It was during this period of history, and before it as well, that the concept of the dwarven castes, that will be elaborated on further later, as well as a lot of cultural phenomenons like ancestor worship started to take shape. Many famous noble houses can trace their origins back to this golden age of the Dwarven Empire. The success of the Empire lost no momentum when the Dwarves started to make contact with the humans as they started to spread across the surface of Thedas after minus 3100 ancient. An alliance was even established with the human nation of Tevinter, soon to be the Tevinter Imperium, and its leader by the now legendary dwarven king Endrin Stonehammer in minus 1200 ancient. As Tevinter was a society based around the use of magic, and the dwarves having an ample supply of lyrium underground, the trading between the dwarves and Tevinter became incredibly lucrative and the alliance between the two have persisted up until modern times, with the Dwarven Ambassadoria from the older days still being present in the Imperium, advising Tevinter and overseeing trade between the two societies. Cultural exchange also became a result of the alliance between the Dwarves and Tevinter, as the Dwarven tradition of arena combat, known as Provings, that were used to settle political disputes, grudges, duels of honor, or simply for entertainment purposes, was later adapted by the Tevinter Imperium on the surface as gladiatorial games. Despite this period being very prosperous for the Dwarven civilization in many ways, and with constant expansion and trade, the Empire did run into some problems. Sources and findings about this event is scarce, but we do know that at some point after the founding of the Tevinter Imperium, but before the fall of Arlatham, the dwarves were involved in some kind of war or armed conflict with a race of creatures called Scaled Ones. These were reptilian humanoids with scaled bodies that had previously been unknown to the dwarves. The conflict does not seem to have had overtly dire consequences for the Empire as a whole, and after the Dwarves seemingly won the conflict, the Scaled Ones seem to have disappeared entirely from the pages of history. Images of reptilian creatures standing on two legs have later been discovered on the surface at an old elven temple in modern day Orlay, as well as in the Dales, but we are not certain if these depictions are Scaled Ones or not and if these creatures had an impact on the surface as well. The true extent of the war between the Dwarves and the Scaled Ones and its full impact will thus have to be the subject of future study. In the year minus 1170 ancient, King Endrin Stonehammer decided out of mostly commerce and trade reasons to move the capital of the Empire from Kalsharok to the ancient seat of the dwarves mining and smithing caste, the Great Taig of Orzammar in southern Thedas. At this time in the Golden Age, the deep roads were well built and maintained, its tunnels stretching far and wide connecting the entire underground empire and its roads were always filled with travelers and merchants. Later in the period, after the fall of Arlathan in minus 975 ancient, many elvish refugees fleeing to Winter fled to the dwarven taig of Kadhalash, an event we covered in the previous lecture. The decision by the dwarves from Kalcharok to eradicate the taig and everyone in it, elf and dwarf alike, was a blemish on dwarvish history at the time that was later forgotten 
as a new taig called Kadash was built on top of the old ruined taig. This event aside, it would seem at the time that the prosperity and glory of the Dwarven Empire would be never-ending, and that this golden era of expansion and progress would go on forever. And I would not fault anyone, especially not the dwarves at the time, for maybe thinking this was the case. But as most of you know about history, nothing truly lasts forever. And nothing could have ever prepared the dwarves for the unimaginable horrors that now awaited them. It began as something small and easily overlooked around the year minus 395 ancient. Travelers started disappearing on their journeys through the deep roads. These incidents few and sporadic at first, but increasing as time went on. Warriors were sent out into the deep roads to patrol the tunnels and find the source of these disappearances, and the matter was thought to be solved. Then some of the warriors started disappearing as well, while on patrol and stationed out in the deep roads. Rumors spread of dark shapes lurking in the shadows of the halls and tunnels, and it is said that strange noises could sometimes be heard coming out of the subterranean depths. These occurrences went on relatively unabated for several years, this period also giving rise to infighting and political unrest in the Empire. Then, in minus 380 ancient, hell flooded out into the deep roads. Out of the depths, untold numbers of dark, twisted creatures emerged, slaughtering every dwarf they could find and spreading like wildfire through the underground tunnels, severing contact between taigs in the process. These hideous beings, their appearances almost seeming to be malformed and monstrous versions of dwarves and other sentient creatures, threw the dwarven empire into chaos. Due to the political infighting of the period, every Taig sought the defense of their own home as most important, which is why the horde of monsters did not meet a unified Dwarven defense early on in the conflict. As the deep roads flooded with monsters, and as Taigs fell one after the other, a horde of these evil creatures barreled straight towards Orsamar. There, it was finally stopped in its tracks, at least temporarily, in large part due to the efforts of a man from the warrior caste named Iduken, the ancestor of the legendary noble house of the same name. Iduken, realizing that the internal infighting and inaction threatened the survival of the entire dwarven race, enlisted the aid of the other castes and took control of Orzammar's armies, eventually beating back the horde of creatures and saving Orzammar at the cost of numerous tigers. But this was far from the end. Led by an abomination in the form of a corrupted and twisted dragon, the horde of monsters had, through the use of the deep roads, found a way to the surface and spread like a plague onto the world above. This apocalyptic event would later be known to history as the First Blight, and the emergence of the creatures known as Darkspawn. As the war raged on the surface, the dwarves tried to recover after this sudden and destructive event that had befallen their empire. An opportunity arrived more than 100 years after the outbreak of the Blight, when the ingenuity of dwarven craftsmanship showed its mettle like it had done so many times before. 
the extremely talented dwarven smith named Caradin made an enormous breakthrough by creating a special anvil called the Anvil of the Void. With this anvil, Caradin created the first golems in existence. These constructs of stone and metal, created by encasing a dwarf in a constructed body and animating it with lyrium, would be guided with the use of control rods, at the cost of the golem's own free will. These golems proved to be nearly unstoppable juggernauts on the battlefield, nearly impervious to all but the most powerful of damage, and were quickly sent into battle against the Darkspawn. Their effectiveness in battle was astounding, and for the first time since the start of the conflict, the dwarves started to push back the Darkspawn from the Deep Roads and reclaim some of their lost territories. Caradin and his apprentices worked tirelessly for six whole years producing golems, but only limiting themselves to volunteers who willingly wanted to become golems and never forced anyone into the constructs. This changed when the ruling king of Orzammar, Valtor, started using undesirables to power the golems instead of volunteers. Criminals, castless, and even dissidents and his own political enemies were made into constructs. Caradin objected to this, and as punishment, he was himself forcefully converted into a golem, but retaining his free will since his apprentices did not know the secrets of constructing control rods. After this, Caradin took the Anvil of the Void and his apprentices with him and disappeared into the Deep Roads, taking the secrets of how to make golems with him. This ended any further construction of golems in the Empire and marked the end of the last real counter-offensive that the dwarves were ever able to make against the Darkspawn. The few rare golems that still remain in modern dwarven society are treated with utmost care as the ancient treasures that they are. Eventually, after almost 200 years of constant war, the Darkspawn was finally defeated and the first blight ended on the surface in minus 203 ancient. In no small part due to a certain organization that will be the topic of future lectures. But this did not mean that the struggle underground had ended, quite the opposite. The Darkspawn continued their war against the dwarves after being driven back underground, now in control of most of the deep roads and having conquered the majority of dwarven tykes. With the unending war never seeming to cease or their enemies tire, their realm and race clinging onto the edge, the four remaining great tykes decided to act in minus 195 ancient. Gundar, Hormak, and Kalshirok, along with the other remaining minor tykes, declared independence and elected their own kings while still retaining their allegiance to Orzammar and its High King. They were determined to work together, cooperate and survive against the onslaught for as long as possible. Unfortunately, this only staved off the end for a short while, as the Darkspawn cut off and relentlessly assaulted the remaining Dwarven Kingdoms in the following decades. And though they fought both fiercely and bravely, they slowly fell, one by one. Believing it to be the only way to safeguard the continued existence of his people, High King Threestone of Orsamar decided to start sealing the remaining deep road tunnels leading to the three other kingdoms in Minus Forty Ancient. Kalsharok, the former capital of the Empire, was ultimately presumed lost, and the road leading to it 
the last of its kind, was sealed in minus 15 ancient. And so, after almost 400 years of constant war, strife, destruction, and decline, Orzammar remained, long thought to be the last remaining bastion of dwarves on Thedas. The impact of the first blight and the darkspawn upon dwarven civilization cannot be overstated. This event changed dwarven history and culture forever, and many of the problems that modern dwarven society faces can be traced back to this period. Never before have the dwarven race been that close to total eradication. The ages that followed after the first blight saw the dwarves of Orzammar recuperate. Despite the near annihilation of the race, the conservative and traditionalist values of the dwarves were still very much a part of their society, though this resulted in many dwarves leaving the underground to find better opportunities on the surface. An aspect that also was to follow after the blight, this problem plaguing dwarves up until modern times, was the increasing infertility of the species. Many speculated this to be a result of the interaction with the darkspawn and their strange and horrible taint. Another important consequence of the first blight was the creation of an entire new branch of the dwarven military called the Legion of the Dead. This elite organization was created specifically for fighting the darkspawn out in the deep roads and are both feared and revered because of the fact that the members of the Legion are, in almost all aspects, dead men and women walking. Contrary to normal dwarven society, any dwarf from any caste and for any reason, whether it is to avoid exile, to gain glory, make amends, or any other personal reason, may join the Legion. Upon their joining, their lives up until that point are stricken from the memories, and they are given a ritual similar to a funeral, where their honor and their family's honor are redeemed. From that point onward, the legionary is considered dead by the rest of dwarven society, and the individuals are expected to live up to their promise of dying a worthy death in battle against the darkspawn. Trained, equipped, and wielding heavy armor and mighty weapons, they are sent into the deep roads to fight the eternal enemy, with their headquarters at Bonamar, also known as the Dead Trenches, a stronghold near Orton Taig. There they hold back the Darkspawn menace. This fortress, designed by Paragon Caradon back in the day, have been the site of much fighting between the Legion and the Darkspawn over the years. So fierce was the battles of Bonamar over the centuries, and the fortress changing hands so many times over the years, that it is said that the scholars at the Shaperit finally lost count of how many times it had changed hands. When exactly the Legion of the Dead was founded is not specifically known. Since the stronghold of Bonamar was designed by Caradin, one can speculate that the organization came to be at some point after this period, but exactly when and under which circumstances are unknown. Orzammar slowly re-established itself as an economical and culturally stable nation over the years. However, many of the still remaining Taigs on the outskirts of Orzammar were still at risk. Ortan Taig, one of these Taigs, still in dwarf hands, was lost to the Darkspawn while the dwarves were aiding Tevinter during the Fourth Blight in 512 to 524 Exalted. At the end of said Blight, the Darkspawn ruled the Deep Roads all the way up to Orzammar, with no one but the dwarves themselves seeming to care or see the danger in this. Stagnation of this sort continued up until modern Dwarvish history, when the famous House Iduken, descendants of the previously mentioned hero, 
took the throne of Orzammar in 896 Blessed. However, a couple of years later, something unexpected occurred, something the dwarves of Orzammar did not anticipate. Cal Shirok, the former capital and great taig of the Dwarven Empire, long thought lost more than 900 years ago, had survived. Despite being cut off from the rest of the world and having its tunnels sealed by Orzammar, who thought them lost, the dwarves of Cal Shirok had carried on for all these years in isolation and survived. This was discovered in 912 Dragon, and was met with much joy and excitement at first, but these jubilations later turned sour as Orzammar almost immediately demanded Cal Shirok to renew its oath of allegiance to Orzammar and its king. And Cal Shirok, who had been abandoned, although unintentionally by their dwarven brothers in their time of need, were not too keen on this proposal. And even in modern Thetis, relations between the two last remaining bastions of dwarves underground remains strained. Modern dwarvish history holds setbacks much like the previous centuries. In 913 Dragon, Bonamar, having survived centuries of darkspawn attacks, is lost permanently to the enemy, but only after heroic resistance from the Legion of the Dead. And in 930 Dragon, King Endrin I Dukin dies, resulting in a succession crisis and political upheaval involving his remaining heirs. This matter is later resolved through outside intervention. But we also have new and fresh accomplishments and victories during this time, the first in many centuries. In 932 Dragon, an army from Orzammar, led by the noble house Helmi, managed to clear a section of the Deep Roads overrun by Darkspawn and recaptured later even recolonizing the ancient dwarven taig of Cal Hirol, situated below the Ferelden city of Amaranthine. So even though their history up until this point has been marred by setbacks and wars, it seems that for the moment at least, maybe the future holds some luck for the dwarven people. With the history of the dwarves overall summarized, we can now move on to talk about dwarven culture in a bit more detail, because there are quite a number of customs, traditions, and phenomenons that you have to understand in order to understand dwarven society. One of the most important and significant of these phenomenons are the caste system. The complexities of the caste system is highlighted quite well by Ferdinand Genetivi in his work In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar, with the following passage. Quote, the society of Orzammar is divided into nobles, warriors, smiths, artisans, miners, merchants, and servants. Now, you are undoubtedly saying to yourself, we have all of those divisions among our own people. This is a dangerous misconception. Certainly, we do have nobility, artisans, merchants, and these positions are largely inherited from our parents. However, the younger children of nobility often choose to be artisans or soldiers. The sons of merchants may join the army or become servants or apprentice themselves to a craftsman. This is all freely chosen, limited perhaps by the circumstances of birth, but still chosen. What is a matter of choice for most human folk is dictated entirely by birth for dwarves. No one may become a smith who was not born to smith cast parents. A servant who marries a noblewoman will never be a noble himself, and although his daughters would be nobles, his sons would be servants for daughters inherit the caste of their mothers, while sons inherit the caste of their fathers." End quote. 
The nobles and warriors are considered high nobility, with merchants, smiths, artisans, and miners being lesser nobility. Then we have the servants, and below them, the castless, considered to be descendants of criminals and other undesirables who have had their faces marked by tattoos to reveal their dishonorable ancestors and their lot in life. Castless dwarves stake out a life of poverty, begging, and in many cases, fall into organized crime. Also, any dwarf who leaves the underground are stricken from the archives of the Shaperet and are from that moment also considered castless, regardless of previous caste. This quite rigid and unjust society is similar in nature to the real-world historical caste system of India. The concept of only inheriting the caste of one's parents have given way to the concept of noble hunters, where dwarves, usually females from lower classes, like casteless, try to seduce members of the higher castes, mostly nobles as per the name, in order to advance their own standing and social status in the caste system. The caste system is just one of many examples of dwarven dedication to tradition, with single-mindedness and sometimes even stubbornness being core principles in dwarven society. These principles have both their positive and negative sides. You could certainly argue that the dwarven race could not have survived this long and under such strenuous circumstances if not for their stubbornness and single-mindedness of its people and, in extension, their traditions. Where other people would have collapsed or have been destroyed, this hardy attitude have seen the dwarves through hardship, and the fact that dwarves have managed to innovate and produce technological inventions far beyond the capabilities of many others could also be attributed to this. But you could also argue the case that stubbornness and single-mindedness also gives way to tunnel vision, pun very much intended. This together with an unwillingness to reform or change the system, or its traditions for the better, towards something more just and fair. Should a dwarf be shackled to a craft his entire life just because his parents were born into that craft? Is a beggar guilty of the criminal behavior of his grandfather and required to bear the same guilt and shame for a crime he did not commit? These are the questions that dwarves will have to ask themselves sooner or later. Dwarvish faith and religion is a very unique concept in comparison to many of the other forms of worship in Thedas. Rather than worshipping a singular divine entity, or a pantheon of gods, the dwarves venerate the stone, the very earth and rock around them. Referred to as a she or her, the stone in itself is the thing that has birthed the dwarven race, protects it and endows it with the abilities of stone sense and the like. She is seen as a motherly figure that sustains and protects the dwarves, and when dwarves die and are returned back to the stone, they will strengthen her if they have lived a good and fruitful life. These dwarves who are returned to the stone become part of the ancestors, guiding spirits who look out for their descendants for all time. Especially accomplished dwarves, skilled inventors like Caradin or warriors like Iduken, can be named paragons by the dwarven assembly. These are characters of virtue and strength that every dwarf should look up to and revere for their extraordinary accomplishments in life. If a paragon is appointed while they themselves are still alive, they are revered as living ancestors in their own right. These are the core fundamentals of dwarven ancestor worship, and their reverence for their forebears and paragons. There are those dwarves, however, that are said to be rejected by the stone when buried. Castless dwarves, or dwarves that have disgraced either themselves or their ancestors. These rejected spirits 
instead of becoming guides for their descendants, are believed to become wandering rock wraiths who live in the darkest of caverns and tunnels, and according to dwarven fairy tales, cause deliberate cave-ins and kidnap miners down into the depths. Considering what we already discussed about the Titans, their role in this faith can only be speculated at. Knowledge about the existence of the Titans in Dwarven society is not common knowledge among the populace, and limited to a small amount of people. Could the Titans be the stone? Maybe a manifestation of the stone, considering how they seemingly can shape the earth around them. Much of this is speculation, and we can only guess at this stage. High quality craftsmanship and technological advancements that more often than not outshine most other craft on the surface is a testament to the ingenuity of Dwarven society, despite its rugged and strict caste system. Not only are Dwarven masonry, architecture and buildings in general extremely robust and of high quality, the Deep Roads being an excellent example of this, the technology that Dwarves have managed to produce like mechanical weaponry, clockwork, and limited steam power are feats of wonder. Golems could also very much be counted into this series of technological advancements, with the extra detail that this is technology and crafts that involve lyrium. Lyrium, as we have mentioned briefly before, is an underground mineral with strong magical properties. If mined, processed, and used correctly, it can be useful for a variety of purposes and means, for example enchanting weapons and objects with magical runes that grant certain extraordinary effects. The Dwarven Shaperet also uses Lyrium to craft runes as part of their archives. These archives, called memories, being made by Lyrium enables the written runes to contain and preserve the actual thoughts of the ones who wrote the runes. Lyrium was a key component in creating golems, as we discussed in regards to Caridon, and other items like self-glowing stones and even explosives can be created with this magical mineral, and with fine and precise care Lyrium can even be applied to the skin to create tattoos, but this practice is far from common. But one of the most common uses of Lyrium is ingesting the mineral, mostly through liquid form. Lyrium potions can be used by mages to grant them additional powers and more mana, as well as in magical rituals to enter the Fade spiritually while being awake. In contrast, Templars, who protect against unsanctioned magic, can use Lyrium to gain resistance against magic and even dispel magical spells. Since there are many institutions on the surface in need of the processed mineral, the Lyrium trade from Orzammar to the nations on the surface is one of the most lucrative trade aspects of Dwarven society, and one of the major points of interactions between Dwarves and those who dwell on the surface of Thedas. But Lyrium is not a harmless mineral to deal with. Far from it. Only Dwarves, specifically the Dwarven mining caste, are skilled enough to find and mine the rare mineral, and it is an integral part of the Dwarven economy. Despite their natural resistance, Dwarves can still be affected by the mere presence of raw lyrium, with extended exposure potentially leading to memory loss and deafness, and other races are even more susceptible to this volatile and rare mineral. In its unprocessed form, elves, humans, and kunari can experience severe mental and physical injuries as well as damages by simply being near or touching raw lyrium and mages risk dying on the spot if they even come close to lyrium in its unprocessed form. Due to the dwarves' special relationship with the mineral, lyrium has become a central part of not only dwarven culture, but also their history and economy. 
Not all dwarves live underground, but those who leave the embrace of the stone for one reason or another are shunned and despised by the rest of dwarven society underground and considered castless. These are the so-called surface dwarves. Whether driven to the surface, sent into exile, or going out of their own choice, whatever the reason, many dwarves leave the underground and settle on the surface. So many dwarves in fact move and are being born on the surface that some speculate that they will soon outnumber those underground. Most of the surface dwarves take up a profession as merchants or craftsmen, often in line with what their caste might have been underground. And many still join the Dwarven Merchants Guild, a trade organization run by surface dwarves that focuses on what commercial prospects might be won on the surface. As mentioned before, in the eyes of underground dwarves, their surface siblings are considered both legally and culturally to be castless. Insults like cloud gazer and stone blind are examples of the extremely taboo notion of leaving the stone, the thing that binds the dwarven race together for the surface. Since they are castless, surface dwarves are not only stripped of their former caste and expunged from the memories by the Shaperets, if they at all had a caste to begin with, and are not permitted to enter the underground realm ever again. They are mostly viewed with disdain by every aspect of Dwarven society, considered to be lost to the stone. And this thinking does have some merit, since the Dwarves rely on their keen stone sense and resistance to magic for much of their life and work, and both of these things become less potent the more time a Dwarf spends on the surface. Even the castless of Orzammar consider themselves better than surface Dwarves, since they at least still live in the stone while being destined to be rejected by her, whereas the surface dwellers have knowingly rejected her entirely, according to them. One might imagine that once a dwarf leaves the strict society of Orzammar for the surface, the burdens of the caste system and other oppressive aspects of dwarven culture would be none of their concern anymore. But that is actually not the case, interestingly enough. After thousands of years, the caste system, along with many other aspects of Dwarven culture, are so ingrained in the mentality of your average Dwarf, that even those who knowingly tries to abandon its shackles might find it very difficult. As with many things that bring a strict and hierarchical view of the world, as much as it can be limiting, it can also lend a sense of purpose, comfort, and community. Take all those things away, and someone has to build up their own moral values from scratch, often through their own strength of will alone, and that is not the easiest thing to accomplish. The issue of the old caste system is something that still splinters the surface dwarf community, from a personal level all the way up to the halls of the Merchants Guild. Upper and lower classes still exist among surface dwarves, and those of the upper strata might consider themselves better than the others. These people might also still be in contact with individuals underground for trade reasons. In regards to the conflict of tradition, the upper classes of surface dwarves in, for example, the Merchants Guild, can be split into two groups. The Ascendant, who want to leave every aspect of the Dwarven caste system behind them and start anew on the surface, and the Kalna, who insists on sticking with the traditional caste system of Orzammar while on the surface. One of the few unique exceptions to surface dwarves being permitted underground are the surface trade with Orzammar. Surface merchants wishing to trade in Orzammar, especially goods like grain, wheat, and wood that are hard to come by underground, are limited to a specific part of Upper Orzammar, and are not allowed to venture further into the city. Since they are also castless, surface merchants trading in Orzammar are required to wear the tattoo 
or brand of the castless on their face while going about their business. Though many dwarves adapt to this rule by using tattoo ink that can be washed off after their visit. The disdain they face from underground dwarves is considered to be hypocrisy of the highest order among many surface dwarves. After all, Orzammar is reliant upon the lyrium trade to the surface. Much of it is being maintained by the merchant guild and individual surface traders. And many a dwarf in Orzammar would go hungry or lack components for their trade were it not for the supplies that the dwarves on the surface brought to trade in Orzammar. As with most cultural phenomena, the dwarves on the surface and those underground have a very complicated relationship with each other. The three major dwarven settlements underground that we know of are, as stated previously, Orzammar, Kalsharok, and Kalhirol. The various minor tykes like Iduken and Orton on the outskirts of Orzammar territory could be counted as additional settlements, but since they are no longer in dwarven hands, and were recently lost, they are not relevant at the moment. Here follows a description of each of these dwarven settlements, their location, environment, culture, etc. We start with Orzammar, since it is the primary taig of dwarves underground, and the one we know most about. Orzammar is situated in southern Thedas, below the mountain range of the Frostback Mountains, in the western part of the human surface nation of Ferelden. Home to more than 100,000 dwarves, the ancient taig is split into different sections corresponding with different purpose and castes. Closest to the entrance, to the surface, leading in and out of the taig, is the Hall of Heroes, a grand hallway dedicated to the living ancestors and the stone. Statues of dwarven paragons line the hall, making a strong impression on anyone passing through it, especially emissaries from the surface who will marvel at the grandeur of dwarven craftsmanship and culture, but also for those dwarves who think of leaving the underground for the surface. Thus, they do so under the judging eyes of the ancestors. Next, we have the level of the commons, where most of Orzammar's population lives. Here, the different castes of the dwarves live and pursue their daily work or run shops and stalls connected to their caste. Since surface dwarves are only allowed to trade their goods in the commons, there is always a number of surface merchants present at their regulated stalls at a given time. Built in close proximity to the commons are also the Proving Grounds, where ceremonial arena matches will be held on several occasions. A place of entertainment not only for the dwarves of the commons, but for all of Orzammar. Built a level above the commons is the Diamond Quarter. This is where the Taig's richest and most powerful individuals live. It is home to numerous noble houses and their respective mansions. In the Diamond Quarter, one might also find the halls of the Dwarven Assembly, the seat of government, the archives and libraries of the Shaperet, and the royal palace where the reigning monarch of Orzammar resides. Under normal circumstances, only nobles and their retinues are permitted entry into the Diamond Quarter, while dwarves of other castes are forbidden to enter. Certain exceptions are made during feasts or other celebrations for merchants to trade in the quarter. Sometimes noble hunters manage to get through also into the quarter, unbeknownst to its guards. Whether this is through trickery, sneaking, or the greasing of palms, depends. The Diamond Quarter is built at the top of the Dwarven City, to represent the hierarchy of Dwarven society and the might of the people living and ruling there. So, at the bottom of the city, at the bottom of the pyramid, lives the dwarves with the least power, opportunities, and prospects in life, the castless. This city section is known as Dust Town, and is the most impoverished part of Orzammar, where the poor and the homeless, the beggar and the criminal, all scrape by to survive another day. Among the dilapidated and ruined buildings 
Rival gangs and criminals fight over money and resources, with the poor and the needy often getting stuck in the middle. Since the city guards seemingly cannot be bothered to patrol Dust Town, the underclass must fend for themselves. After all, they are all castless and deemed worthless and wretched by the rest of Dwarven society. Since minor raids by the Legion of the Dead, or even specific noble families accompanied by guards, sometimes do occur, there are still small entrances into the Deep Roads, but these are heavily guarded and patrolled, only to be opened on exceptionally rare occasions. Moving on to Cal Shirok, the former capital of the Dwarven Empire, we know less about this Taig than for example Orzammar. This is a result of the Taig's long isolation and the fact that the overwhelming amount of sources about Dwarven civilization that was not lost in or after the First Blight comes from or is still stored in Orzammar. But what we do know is the following. Cal Shirok is situated below the Hunterhorn Mountains, Thedas' largest mountain range, and between the nations of Orlay and the Anderfels. It is categorized as one of the 12 original Great Taigs and Kingdoms of the Dwarves, and given its previous status as capital, it might have rivaled Orzammar and the other kingdoms in, in population and stature at one point in history, but this is just speculation. Almost one millennia of isolation have made the dwarves of Cal Shirok distant and distrustful towards much of the outer world, especially other dwarves from Orzammar. After being abandoned to fend for themselves and surviving at great cost, the prospect of swearing fealty to Orzammar again is not something that sits well with Cal Shirok dwarves. This mentality has also shaped the Taig's culture in a distinct and different way. Despite their isolation, the Taig has seemingly continued trading with the surface in some aspects, which puts the idea of Cal Shirok being rediscovered in 912 in some new light. While we know next to nothing of Cal Shirok as a city, we know a bit more about its inhabitants and how it is governed. They do not place as much of an emphasis on caste as opposed to Orzammar. Its assembly is not restricted to nobles only, like in Orzammar, but other influential caste members may hold office as well. The leader of the assembly and Cal Shirok as a whole is called the Paragon Elect. This seat of office also highlights the different systems that Cal Shirok dwarves hold in regards to the ancestors and paragons. In Cal Shirok, paragons are not nominated and revered for the deeds of the past, but for the deeds that have been promised in the future. Instead of grand statues, paragons are immortalized with huge wall carvings after their death. Because of the strained relationship between Orzammar and Cal Shirok, Neither of the two Taigs recognize the value and worth of each other's unique paragons. Interestingly enough, Cal Shirok, no doubt having been able to survive this long due to their fierce resistance towards the Darkspawn, have their own version of the Legion of the Dead. Known by the more casual name of Rockknockers, this battalion of hardy warriors do not share the same solemn nature as the legions in neither name nor mentality, but are an interesting example of how similar organizations can evolve but take on a vastly different style due to culture. Dwarves from Cal Shirok also seem to exhibit different linguistic traditions and appearances as opposed to other dwarves. Their dwarven dialect is strange and unusual in comparison with other types of dwarven, their skin is also paler than others of their race, and many who meet Cal Shirok dwarves tell of an almost indescribable feeling in their presence. Something eerie and strange, possibly even tainted. Some describe similarities to the Darkspawn or those affected by their taint in their presence of these dwarves. And considering the fact that many speculate the growing infertility of dwarves to be the fault of the Darkspawn taint, Something similar might have happened to the denizens of Cal Shirok, but none can say for sure. Last, we have the recently reconquered Cal Hirol. 
Situated in eastern Ferelden, below the human city of Amaranthine, Calhirol was named after the talented smith and warrior Paragon Hirol. Hirol and his apprentices made numerous breakthroughs in the field of smithing, with improvements to golem designs and the storage of refined lyrium, making the Taig famous for its smithing techniques long after Hirol's death, and bringing immense glory and prosperity to the settlement. Categorized as a Great Taig, the settlement was lost sometime during the First Blight, but has since then been reconquered by the noble house Helmi, and many of the descendants of those who fled Calhirol during the Blight, including House Hirol, can still be found in Orzammar today. The Taig is divided into three main parts, the Main Hall, the Trade Quarter, and the Lower Reaches. The Main Hall housed the Taig's commons as well as slums, the trade quarters were the center of commerce and smithing as well as the shrine and final resting place of Paragon Hirol, and the lower reaches being the lowest part of the Taig. Formerly accessible over a bridge crossing an underwater river, much of the Great Taig lies in ruins after its abandonment and destruction at the hands of the Darkspawn that inhabited the settlement up until 931 Dragon. The Taig will no doubt have started to be rebuilt by House Helmi and other dwarves now that the Great Taig once again is connected to Orzammar. With the majority of the old Taigs and the Deep Roads now lost to the dwarves, there is undoubtedly secrets and mysteries about dwarven history that have been lost or forgotten throughout the ages. As we learned last lecture with the Sentinel Elves, Aspects of the old world might still be out there, hidden and waiting to be rediscovered. That is also very much the case for the Dwarven past, as the following two examples and recent discoveries shed new light on aspects of the Dwarven past that was up until this point unknown or forgotten. In 931 Dragon, an expedition into the Deep Roads from Kirkwall's Merchant Guild led by the dwarf Bartrand Tethrys, discovered an ancient taig that appeared to be older than anything previously encountered. This taig had been mentioned in a secret report to Orzammar some time ago, rumors from miners talking about a forgotten settlement far below the normal deep roads. It was considered just that, a rumor up until it was actually discovered. This ancient taig, predating any of dwarven civilization encountered previously, was built in a style and displayed a culture that was quite alien to what dwarves were normally associated with. Statues and architecture depicted not ancestors or paragons of some sort, but a strange and unknown dwarven pantheon of gods and temples to these gods could be found in the Taig. Many of the structures of the Taig are also observed as having been impossible to build without the use of magic. This should, as we now know, be impossible since dwarves are not able to use magic, and yet the buildings are still there. The other odd and shocking aspect of this taig is the presence of an entirely new sort of lyrium. Red lyrium. Seemingly giving off an entirely different song than normal lyrium, this strange red version of the magical mineral spreads throughout the entire taig, and whether or not it has other magical properties from normal lyrium, or where it came from overall, is a highly researched subject in Thedas' scholarly circles. After its discovery, the leader of the expedition abandoned the rest of his employees in the Deep Roads to fend for themselves, escaping with a mysterious relic from this primeval taig. From that point onward, the place became known as Bartrand's Folly. The second example, revolves around a secretive 
ancient and until recently unknown organization of dwarves called the Shah Britol. Meaning revered defenders in Dwarven, this group of militant zealots was encountered deep beneath the earth in 941 Dragon by groups sent from Orzammar and the surface. This group, armed with lyrium-infused weapons and armor, and speaking ancient Dwarven, these dwarves seem to exist for a singular purpose, to protect the Titans and their holdings deep down into the abyss, farther down than anyone has ever traveled before, to the lyrium-filled bastion of the pure and the legendary wellspring and they will defend their domain against any intruders, darkspawn, surfacer, and dwarf alike. Scholarly studies made by the previously mentioned Shaper Volta concludes that from the settlements, inscriptions, and findings, that the Shah Bretol are indeed primeval, maybe even predating dwarven civilization as we know it, but that they somehow have strayed from their path and become misled in their mission to protect the Titans. It is unsure whether or not the organization of the Shah Britol predates the primeval Taig or vice versa, or indeed what exactly the group's connection to the Titans are. Even such things as where the dwarves of the Shah Britol come from, if they have a Taig of their own, or how they supply themselves with arms and armor, is still basically unknown. Many of these things are shrouded in mystery, and will require further study in order to unearth its secrets. Lastly in this lecture we come to the Dwarven Tongue. As a language, modern Dwarven is a splintered one. Where there once was a myriad of different Dwarven languages, now there is only one, and it is very seldom spoken fluently or extensively by modern Dwarves, as it was back in the day. Instead, Dwarves use Old Dwarven to relay and explain certain concepts and principles that are central to Dwarven life. Some of these words, like Amgarak, meaning victory, Amgeforn, meaning sacrifice, and Isana, literally meaning singing stone, as in lyrium, are used when appropriate and date back to a time before the dwarves made contact with elves or humans on the surface. Instead of Old Dwarven, modern dwarves speak the common tongue, as the name implies the most common language in Thedas, spoken by the majority of surfacers. It is used to facilitate trade not only between dwarves but also people from the surface, and thus very few dwarves are not fluent in the common tongue. There are of course a couple of exceptions. As far as we can gather, the Shah Britol dwarves only speak ancient dwarven and do not respond or seem to understand the common tongue. The dwarves of Kalsharok, as we have mentioned previously, speak a very distinct and different dialect of Dwarven from their siblings in Orzammar. Whether this dialect is a result of their long isolation, or if this distinct language aspect goes back to the days of the Dwarven Empire, is uncertain. Those are the questions that future linguists will have to answer. Certain words from the common tongue, because it is so readily spoken in Dwarven society, also gets added into the Dwarven idea of concepts and linguistic uses. Words like topside to describe the surface, and cloud gazer to signify a surface dwarf who has lost his innate stone sense, are examples of this. Examples of more traditional phrases in Dwarven could be a trastvala, a formal greeting literally meaning find your tongue, or simply speak. Or a trust tonsha, a formal farewell. Perseverance, hardiness, and stubbornness have seen the dwarven race through near annihilation many times during its existence. They have endured, just like the stone they revere and guided by their watching ancestors. 
Their ingenuity as craftsmen and innovators is without question, and many below ground as well as on the surface of Thedas are reliant on their trade and ingenuity. Their culture is ancient, and their traditions and castes paramount to them. But will such strict ideas survive forever? Will change and reform come, or will the bedrock remain as it has always been? The Dwarves of Thedas has met many challenges throughout their history, and only with time will we see if their future will be forged from an old mold or shaped into a new form. Thank you all very much for your attention today. I have been Professor Absalom, and I will see you all in the next lecture. Thank you very much for watching this video, and a special thank you to everyone who has been who have been subscribing for the last couple of months. I know that this video has been a long, long time coming. I've taken it's taken a, a couple of months, but the amount of people that have subscribed to this channel and the amount of support that have, that I, that you guys have shown, it's absolutely insane. Uh, I I'm just a guy to, who's talking about lore that I think that I think is interesting and this really shows to me that this is content that people uh, value that people would like to watch so a huge huge it's humbling it's a, a huge huge thank you to everyone who has subscribed it, you guys are the best this is amazing um, hopefully in the I know my time schedule my 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 consistency when it comes to uploading have hasn't been the best but hopefully um during the coming days i will upload a kind of an update video um where i will be talking about my scheduling when it comes to the dragon age lore series um what videos i will uh work on in the near future and also how long the overall Dragon Age lore series will be as I as I'm planning it out and maybe also um, some of the ideas in the uh, far in the future of what I might be doing after the Dragon Age lore series and other other lore series that I have had that I've been thinking about but yeah once again a huge huge thank you to the support that you have shown me to all the subscribers um please like share uh subscribe uh plop down a comment down in the comment section it will make the algorithm feel really happy and uh, until next time have a good one